Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming. I know this is um, falling kind of late in the conference, so uh, we appreciate you spending the afternoon with us uh, rather than spending it at any of the other number of great events that you could be at. Um, my name is Drew Apolitti. I'm going to do a brief introduction of our panel here, um, and then we're just going to kind of roll into some slides for you. Uh, the panel is called A Modeled City, A Case Study. Um, our panelists are Neil Forrest, uh, Dr. Petra Gruber, Charlie Ogeen, and myself. Um, what this is based on is uh, some grant work that we have done to seek funding to create an experiential learning environment for students. Um, and those would be students at the University of Akron in Akron, Ohio, which is where I have recently uh, assumed a teaching position. We've opted to bring in as many um, outside voices as we can, and that's what this panel is comprised of. So we've created this platform to let students kind of look around uh, at the world and at their city as a uh, basis for their own investigations in art and we want them to kind of find things in the city we have very much a town and gown mentality in akron um, we have people who are not related to the university and those of us who are are um, guilty in that very academic way of not often leaving the campus so the format of this was to create a situation where students would be uh, not only encouraged, but absolutely uh, required to get out into the community, uh, hopefully meet people, hopefully find things that they had never uh, looked for um, earlier, and, and use that as fuel for their own kind of personal and professional art making practice. Um, just in a basic way, I would like to thank the University of Akron for their kind funding of this project, and this is the Myers School of Art which is our name school, as well as the Experiential Learning Center, which is uh, across campus for us. But they'd all gone ahead and produced um, or found, found the funding for this kind of out there thing that we wanted to do. Um, the goals of our panel are really just to introduce you to um, and unpack our project so that you are able to understand that. We're going to start by asking each of the presenters to contextualize their research and their interest in the project. Um, as well, we'll go on our, our way to explore the panel's thoughts on what it means to uh, work collaboratively, but across disciplines. While uh, Neil Forrest and I are both uh, clay practitioners, I think we draw a lot of influence from outside of clay. And I don't know that Charlie or Petra even um, are that interested in clay. And we think that that combination creates something that is actually quite lively. Um, and maybe most important in all of this is how you talk about bouncing back and forth between one medium uh, and many materials. And lastly, we're just going to open it up to have a bit of a roundtable conversation um, about what we're thinking and just some questions, I guess, mainly that I'm struggling with. Um, I think like everybody, I have uh, things in my work that I'm not sure about. and one of the best but maybe hardest things to do when you're in your professional practice is find on the right people to call and and just talk about the things that you're struggling with and I thought I would uh, foist that on my colleagues here today and and hopefully use it as a way for us all to get somewhere um, that we haven't been and kind of just dig around some thoughts that are that are plaguing us so I will uh, turn this over to Neil and he's going to contextualize what he does for you uh, thanks a lot, Drew, and I, I want to know my, why my panelists don't like clay, but <laughs> that'll be in the Q&A part. Um, shout out to Montreal and uh, Cleveland as we start. Um, I wanted to uh, show a few things um, of the kind of collaborative nature of which I do as, as a teacher, but also as a kind of, uh, I, I guess, uh, professional and, and amongst collaborators. I'm really interested in my colleagues at the School of Architecture, uh, which is in Halifax, and we have gone on to do a number of uh, pedagogical projects, but that's led to some other interesting things that have happened with um, other American collaborators and other things that deal with the relationship of ceramics to architecture. So that defines one of my interests. And what we see on the screen, and I guess it's uh, the first one up, is uh, a form that was uh, based on one of my ceramic nodes, uh, a kind of a piece uh, component that was in a matrix, and a colleague of mine at the School of Architecture s saw that as an opportunity uh, to uh, speculate this kind of uh, 
way of making form through a plastic material as a possibility to kind of re-engineer it as a kind of assembled form what what was once a plastic solid now a hollow that that could actually fit the program of a library so this is a project that we did for uh, a competition in um, in Korea uh, next Drew uh, it, it didn't win the competition but we think we had an interesting uh, building um, this piece represents another kind of interest that I have in architecture and that's a, a kind of a way of thinking through uh, behaviors and experience so if architecture is can be something else other than the building it's certainly representative of, of the way we think the way we um, uh, uh, relate to other people and this piece um, was actually done uh, when I was invited to an exhibition in honor of uh, Dennis Smith's uh, retirement, I asked him to send me a paragraph on what he had uh, experienced as a child, uh, what his memories are of the space that he lived in. And so I used his um, rather romantic and sentimental um, uh, uh, reflections on his own childhood, as we all might have, and I reproduced to my way of thinking the kind of place that he was in and so I just took the void spaces of the rooms that were important to him and then I kind of manifest them as physical experience so what I did was created a model which is another thing that my architectural colleagues uh, beside me would be very familiar with the idea of kind of miniaturizing an idea um, a, a plan to think through how you will build something uh, but in this case it's a mechanism to remember things so architecture as as memory it's a kind of archaeological experiment as I think we could all imagine um, architecture as being so for me architecture is a, is a, a way to uh, uh, speculate on other ideas about culture and self as well as structure I mean we're all interested in building so th and that's one of the reasons why modeled city became its uh, w we attach the name to this uh, teaching project next Drew. Um, I, I did teach in Scandinavia in Oslo and um, for a number of years and this is a project that I took to the School of Architecture and co-taught with the Dean and uh, the architecture students um, figured out very efficient ways with uh, with me and, and their dean about how to we essentially created an outdoor room and although you see the building in the background this is a winter scene and the table itself is is heated so that the table is the kiln and it's this kind of community space that we created and in the end it was kind of an outdoor living room it was a kind of fascinating thing especially when you're thinking about temperate climates when when everything is very cold and one of the things about architecture is thinking about a relationship to um, uh, uh, civitas, to, to civil society, to how we relate to each other in public spaces. And so that's what this was kind of an exercise in. So we built things to sit on, um, ways in which you, you can kind of relate, but doing that outdoors. Uh, the next one. Um, this piece, although not... Uh, particularly a kind of collaborative in the sense where you actually have a, a kind of a democracy um, uh, this was a, a slightly less democratic thing but where I went to um, Andy Brame and his matter factory and I said Andy I want to build these pieces for, for a particular ex exhibition I want to build the biggest ceramic things I can and I took for the idea um, a kind of amphitheater or or a giant bowl and I took shreds of they were objects that were, in fact, little tiny flakes that were uh, drilled and, and chomped through um, uh, a tree on my property because there's, uh, there was a lot of infestation of um, uh, beetles and ants. And so carpenter ants actually created these shapes, but they, they would have only been shapes inside the tree that were just a matter of uh, centimeters long. And these, these particular iterations of the flake that I saw were are about between two and three meters, so up to nine feet long. And then there's a big cellular structure on the back. So my colleague Petra uh, on, on the panel here, she'll maybe uh, f flesh in things that are relate architecture to biomimesis. And that's a little bit what I was thinking here. What's the cellular structure that I can build on these giant slabs in order to kind of hoist them into space? And um, it's, it's neither architecture n nor art. It's that in-between uh, kind of area that 
perhaps Rosalind Krauss um, has expressed best in, in a, a, the, the, what is it, expanded field? Sculpture, Sculpture in the expanded field. Hey, how you doing, Ari? Um, <laughs> could I have the next one? Um, this will be my last slide here. And uh, another kind of form of uh, representation in, in, that I did in, in this piece uh, when I was living in Oslo I, as a kid you know you're always fascinated by certain things and I was fascinated by the Arctic I'm Canadian the high Arctic was always a, a kind of thing <laughs> that that was uh, a kind of a fabulous recollection and here I kind of indulged myself in thinking about well I can go back to this boyhood thing and I can make models and so models are uh, tremendous things. They're, they allow you to kind of think through on a miniature scale, do things that only other people can, but you can take command of these things by working in a kind of uh, miniaturized, for lack of a better word, sense, but where you're kind of representing uh, the, the larger forces uh, in a smaller format or fo smaller scale. And in this one, I took four um, ships that related to Norway that form part of their identity in the modern that, that actually led, I think, these, these boats were kind of emblematic of Norway as it forged its, its own um, uh, distinction from Denmark and, um, uh, and Sweden. And I took four different events that have happened in Norway, including um, the, the, the rather recent terrorist uh, uh, activity of Anders Breivik, and, and embedded uh, those events into the building by representing them as pieces of architecture. So I took the Fram, the Ua, Northern Star, and the, and, um, the Maud, um, which lies at the bottom of the Arctic Ocean in Canada, um, is, uh, as kind of ways in which to install inside little pieces of architecture of, uh, the, the, uh, of things that, that were, caused great friction in Norway. And so yet I set them in their beloved um, uh, ships and and it's it's sort of an act of respect as much as it is a, a kind of uh, uh, act of conflict I suppose so um, the kinds of work that I've done have been both um, a collaborative and mostly as a kind of single studio artist Great. Uh, so for perhaps my first uh, moderator foul was I neglected to say that Neil Forrest is a professor of art at Nova Scotia College of Art and Design in Halifax, Nova Scotia, but I would like to repair that by saying it now. Um, our next speaker, uh, Petra Gruber, is an associate professor of biomimicry, um, or excuse me, biomimetics in the Biomimicry Center at the University of Akron uh, in Akron, Ohio. Thank you, Drew. You're welcome. Uh, thanks for being here. Thanks for inviting me to this panel. Um, I have a background as an architect, but I was always very interested in biology and was super happy when I discovered the field of biomimetics when I did my diploma thesis ages ago. <laughs> and uh, then embarked on that field and did a PhD, which was by that time pretty unusual for an architect. And so it was also really difficult to set up this uh, interdisciplinary work and it still is in terms of you know getting projects funded and it still is in terms of administration at the university sitting between Meyer School of Art as my main appointment and the Department of Biology and creating traffic between science and the arts. And as an architect I, I'm intrigued by Akron as well. I just moved here two years ago from a European context also having lived a lot of time abroad in Africa and having done research in Asia where other developments occur in terms of urban development and economic development, especially Addis Abeba where I've taught for three years was really impressive in its you know fast development and all those urban themes come back to me in a way is looking at Akron with its a bit rust belty atmosphere and also those interesting layers of historical development that you could see in the city. So I was really interested in uh, observing the project developing more or less from a distance. And uh, Drew and I, being at the same university in the same department, have embarked on quite a bit of discussion on how we could collaborate. And I have to say I'm pretty interested in clay. <laughs> so I've done a bit of research in traditional architectural typologies and adobe building 
is, is something that covers at least half of our planet in terms of built environment, I would guess. Uh, it's increasingly replaced by concrete, but I think it's still a very, very important building material, maybe not so much perceived here in the US in our li Western, you know, modern tradition of building. So what I'm doing is, is work at this intersection between architectural built environment and the sciences, especially biology. And what you see here in this picture is a bird's nest. I, I believe it's a cardinal's nest that we found uh, in one of the field stations of the biology department in Ohio. And we took on as a, as a, as we say, biological role model, as we call it, looking at specific phenomena from nature to learn from them for a technologic, mainly technological translation. So I'm interested in built structures, I'm interested in material structures. So as you might know, materials in biology are never just bulk material, they are highly structured on many levels of hierarchy. So we look at things on, on different scales and uh, try to understand uh, uh, the qualities and try to understand the characters of, of those materials. And the bird's nest research is, a, is, is actually uh, not a new thing. So scientists have looked at bird's nest, physicists have tried to understand the entangled matter and there's papers about uh, those, you know, uh, uh, structures that we took on as a as a base uh, for doing a like a research and design workshop last year in Germany at the Bauhaus in Bernau, which was really interesting because it also takes on a traditional craftsmanship of weaving and basket making as a base for you know uh, embarking. Uh, uh, to a new design, so we have two sources. One source is like biology, physics, understanding natural structures, and the other source is traditional ways of production or maybe novel ways of production. And uh, in a very intense 10-day workshop, we embarked on translating those structures into architectural and artistic objects, and you will see a few of them in the following slides. So the next slide uh, shows uh, What's what, what seems to be a random object, but it's actually based on research that the students did on the material properties on the various aspects of a nest. And then they collected trash material around the place where we were working, and they found an incredible amount of trash in a very, very short time. I think uh, this was, you know, all collected within a time frame of 15 minutes in the nearby forest, and there was even a car tire among it, so it was really amazing. The amount of trash that people just leave in random places is just incredible. And so they, they, uh, and they imposed the research that they did on the actual bird's nest onto the trash and selected the positioning of those trash materials in this artificial nest according to what they had learned uh, from the natural example. So it's not just a funny object, it's actually also taking on a piece of research within the time frame that we had to interpret it in a new way. And then we also took on like uh, 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 papers that we had read about the physics of those entangled structures and tried to mimic uh, with with a very narrow uh, frame set, uh, try to make new interpretations of those structures. If you show the next slide, Drew, uh, you can see a structure that tries to generate a geometry that is always connecting, where one piece is always connecting to six other pieces, six other elements. So this was another setup that was based on scientific findings. And uh, the next project took on like weaving and basket making as a principle of uh, reinterpretation of birds' nests. So what you see here are partly uh, very scientific approaches, but partly also uh, very aesthetic interpretations of what a bird's nest could mean. And I think this whole breadth of uh, interpretations is a valid one in terms of biomimicry and biomimetics. Uh, but the center point for uh, the science of biomimicry or the field of biomimicry as a methodology, I think, is a functional translation. And uh, I'm doing research in that field at the University of Akron, so we are looking at 
uh, the biology, for example, of snake skin in the next slide, or of gecko skin, the next slide, taking on those surface structures for also functional interpretations about roughness, about friction, uh, uh, and also about architectural qualities and translate that. And I work in research projects and I also teach design classes for graduate and undergraduate students from different disciplines in that in that area. Yeah, so that's uh, a long introduction and uh, I'm pretty interested in uh, the outcome of your project and to discuss this with a bunch of questions later on. Thank you. Uh, so this is the, the basis of my own work. Um, in 1999, I had the uh, fortunate opportunity uh, to travel to China along the old Silk Road. Um, and this is from a series of Buddhist grottos um, along the Silk Road in the uh, Mogao Caves. Um, this is the Western Cave of a Thousand Buddhas, and it's always captivated me um, start to finish for its ability to combine uh, unfired ceramic material uh, as well as three-dimensional uh, architectural elements and sculpture and, and this uh, kind of amazing graphic patterning. I find that um, in my own work when I'm frustrated by something, that's when I continue to come back to it. And I found myself always kind of intrigued on how this room flattened itself, even though when you were in there, you couldn't help but understand that you were in a confined space. You were in there with uh, human-sized objects, but the room itself flattened uh, its own point of view into just a graphic. And I feel like I've chased that through materials and through experiences kind of ever onward in my work. Um, while I was in graduate school, I uh, would continually encounter uh, this window space. Um, and it, this is in a building designed by Rafael Maneo. And uh, as any kind of upstart graduate student, I was uh, in deep question of his uh, spatial choices. This window was uh, kind of ridiculous to me. So I wanted to figure out how to remove this, uh, this blight of architecture uh, with something that I actually found far more enjoyable to look at. And I had gone ahead and taken some time to replace it with um, a series of red cedar shingles. I felt that that was something connected to the architecture of my uh, native New England that was absent in Detroit, Michigan. And it was something that I found warm and pleasing rather than this uh, kind of oculus that looked out onto a frozen, uh, dead Michigan landscape um, You know, in the winter. I believe this was done in February. So by that point, it had probably snowed about 75 times. Um, and I think I wanted to look at something that was heartening rather than disheartening. That continued to carry on in work. Um, this notion of using a module that I either discovered or produced uh, to create a space that was uh, real and unreal and almost um, kind of spiritual at the same time, uh, continued on in work and grew uh, in scale of rather just kind of uh, becoming parasitic on somebody else's architecture, trying to design a bit of my own that encompassed ceramic and encompassed other materials, but really created a quiet, um, heartening experience this piece for similitude was presented at the uh, Tyler School of Art uh, inside of Temple University in Philadelphia um, in an exhibition of mine. And this is uh, trying to create a wave, uh, a, a lapping wave of uh, disparate objects. So you can see in the rhino drawings, each of the shelves uh, has a single cup presented on it. But as you rise up the back wall uh, that you can see on the left, uh, the cups float out deeper and deeper into space. So if you are to look at this flattened object in profile, it has a ton of dimension, but when you look at it head on, it actually looks uh, uh, nothing more than points in space. Other work of mine that has tried to flatten itself while continuing to investigate uh, kind of the influence of an East Asian perspective on ceramics and painting uh, is this momentary slip piece. Um, this was produced uh, in three versions of blue and white porcelain slip to carry on the tradition of Chinese export wear, but to position it in a way that is perhaps um, dynamic so that you can imagine this uh, hammer being balanced ever over um, kind of a precipice of very uh, 
fragile objects that would never be the same were that hammer to fall. Um, I wanted to attempt to freeze that moment in a living sculpture to make a snapshot that was balanced right on the edge before um, something tragic may or may not happen. It's very much a reference to the O. Henry story um, that you all may know called The Lady and the Tiger, where the story ends um, with a person making a fateful decision that had become a setup of death or freedom. And that, that kind of carries on in here and carries on through other works. Um, time I've spent in East Asia uh, had given me an interest in cultural understandings of color. I think here in the West, we look at uh, white as a color of purity and maybe virginal qualities. Whereas um, in places that I had spent time in, in Korea, in China, and in Taiwan, white is looked at as a color of death or a color of loss and absence, um, which is almost completely retrospect to what uh, we would think about it as in our own culture. And for me, that is represented through these uh, cups that are, are void of color and are at the same time angular and very difficult to deal with, um, much of a representation of what I think uh, cross-cultural dialogue can be, something that is very, very necessary, but at the same time not easy to wrap your hands around, not easy to hold, and almost maybe not easy to um, really discuss with any uh, type of complete clarity. Um, that is my work. My interest in architecture is representing it in a scale uh, that is maybe kind of modular and modeled because I have uh, doubts in my own ability to build anything really too large. And I think that would be why uh, Charlie O'Jean, who is up next, is included in this panel, because I think he is perhaps uh, the most fearless individual I know when it comes to building large, uh, tentative things. And Charlie is formerly a college professor at uh, Lawrence Technical University in Detroit. He's recently separated from that position to pursue his ambitions as an architect in the city of Detroit. Thanks, Drew. Uh, I just wanted to go on record by saying that I love Clay. <laughs> <laughs> what he was saying before was bullshit. Um, so like Drew said, um, I've happily separated from the Lawrence Technological University and started my own construction and consulting service um, in Detroit, Michigan, where I live and work. Um, so just briefly, I'm, I'm interested in material energy and the process of building and, and sort of what culture can, can give to help with that process. I'll talk more about that in a second, but I'd like to speak about my work through a few projects. So. Um, this, this project is called 760 Wagner Avenue. It's a very creative title. Um, it's an abandoned masonry home, and what we sort of asked ourselves when we started this, this was together with um, Frank Fatuzzi, um, was about uh, redundancy and was about excess. And so we wanted to really unbuild to test the strength of materials and these sort of composite construction systems. Um, so looking at uh, a cinder block is something that is very redundant, but if you start to remove things, it can corbel, it can do more work than, than we usually give it credit for. Keep the next slide. So as we sort of poked around the building, we noticed that there was actually um, two roofs to the building. There was an original flat roof, and then they had put a truss roof over the top of it. So after we started to remove material from the facades, we, um, we strapped the two roofs together, creating this really strong um, sort of composite roof system. Um, and then we, we began to load the exterior facade by, by removing as much um, energy from, uh, from the interior of the building and then actually hanging, next slide, and then actually hanging the, um, the floor from the roof. So what we've essentially done is removed about half of the structure from the exterior facade and then we're, we're adding more weight to it. Um, but this, for me, this project was really, really important um, because it's, it's using redundancy as an opportunity. Um, it's critiquing the sort of conventionally consuming uh, building systems, which I see as, as very, very superfluous. Um, but it was also a really nice way to see buildings from an alternative advantage point. So seeing buildings from the inside or, or seeing you know, buildings in section and, and um, you know, really getting to the heart of the material and, and thinking about how, um, how those materials and systems really work and function. Yeah, next. Um, this is another project with uh, Frank Fonsuzzi. This is um, uh, a former checker cab building um, in Chicago, um, where the volume gallery, uh, design gallery, it used to used to be. They they just recently moved actually, 
Um, so we began to look at the building and we noticed that again, it was really, really redundant. It, it was actually, um, it was designed to be filled with cars at one point um, because it was a checker cab cars. Um, there was an elevator that could, that could take cars um, to every point in the building. Um, so we wanted to think about how that could, how we could sort of capture uh, the memory of occupation, but also think about um, uh, the structure of the building and, and start to test the structure of the building itself. Um, so we did a formula and we found that each floor could fit 25 cars, um, meaning 125 cars in the building, resting on four tires, which meant 500 cars. So the next step, obviously, Drew, is to go harvest 500 tires. Um, so we, we got 500 tires, we brought them back to the gallery, and then we started this building system of, um, next slide, of these conical, uh, conical helices. And it's, it's much like the previous project where it's actually a really, really simple building system. Um, it's, kind of like, it's kind of like a snake where, um, where the line is continuous, but it's also a lot like a brick system where you've got sort of two, um, two units over one or, or one unit over two. Um, so there's, there's many other parts to this installation. A lot of it had to do with the existing structure and revealing the existing structure. But my favorite, um, our favorite part was obviously um, was the material and really thinking about um, what this material could be used for. Tires are, tires are really, really interesting because they're over-engineered to do one thing, that's it. Um, and as soon as you start to take them away from that, from that function, um, they, they are, they're kind of pesky, but, um, but they do, they have this superhuman strength, which, which very few other materials do. Um, but also, my research looks to reveal material energy um, by exploiting intrinsic material properties. Energy isn't just what we pump into our cars or what we plug into the wall for. It's what's already there and what we can't see. Um, it just has to be harvested or, or sort of cornered. Uh, another part of my practice is, is uh, my practice is kind of two-sided. One. Uh, where these sort of weird material experiments are, you know, sort of re resulting in an installation most of the time in an art gallery, um, and then trying to get those material experiments to jump the fence into sort of um, full-scale architectural um, constructs. So in terms of in terms of jumping that fence, uh, I'm actually pursuing a patent on a tire roofing system. Um, there are at least five other patents that exist on tire roofing systems, um, but they all let in water, um, which doesn't seem to make sense to me. Um, so um, what I've done is I've made a series of um, around 20 full-size uh, mock-ups. Maybe Neil would call them a model, um, and just left them in my backyard to uh, to kind of weather and to test them. So um, if you look at the, the side of the house, you see that, that large one, that four by eight sort of hanging off the house. Next slide. Um, that actually has a plexiglass um, uh, sheathing system so that when it's pouring rain or snowing, I just kind of go under there and stand and see how it's performing. And I'm very surprised and happy to report that it's never leaked. Um, next slide. And so um, after, after a series of years, I'm kind of letting these things weather and, and testing them, they have not they have not really broken down. They've they've held up, and I'm uh, this summer I'll be going for the whole thing and re-roofing my house with with tires. Um, and this next shot is uh, is kind of what it looks like um, uh, without snow or without water. That's it for me. So in creating the um, platform that was the modeled city um, as a course for uh, undergraduate art students uh, seeking BFAs and BA degrees at the University of Akron, we decided the best thing that would be possible would have some kind of organizing umbrella themes. Um, we knew modeled city and modeling as a technique of using your hand uh, to create something was intrinsically tied to clay, but in terms of creating some kind of uh, framework uh, that students could follow and have a path through, we decided that we would organize into four themes, the city as myth, the city as history, the civil community, and constructing the city. And for me, I decided the, the most important part of that would be uh, that this be multimedia, 
not that we kind of exist as the frog in the well, uh, only looking at that little bit of sky we can see. So taking it outside of um, ceramics and looking at everything uh, in totality and trying to lean on people who have investigated and questioned what it means to be in an urban environment uh, and possibly uh, more likely expressed it better and clearer than maybe I could or or had some kind of artifact that students could go back to repeatedly. So I'm going to turn again to Neil Forrest and ask him to introduce uh, some of the materials we presented in these overarching umbrellas and guide you guys through uh, much of what we had given students as, as organization and what became their homework before they started doing this deep dive into all the kind of experiential, experiential excuse me, um, projects that we had created for them and various charrettes. So Neil, I'm going to turn this over to you. Thanks, Drew. Um, so we, we were looking for some themes that uh, might offer the kind of a, a wide stimulus, a kind of wide set of opportunities for those who might um, uh, participate in the course. Um, you know, we also wanted to look at pop culture and, and high culture and look at um, elements that, that could be, help us think about, you know, what way that we can kind of participate in cities as artists. And um, so I just thought to say a few things and give a couple examples of the modeled, modeled city kind of ideas as we were thinking about it. Um, but the project also sought um, to be both material embodiment and a communications experiment. I think that will be, uh, I, I, we'll see how the students, some of whom we welcome and are here, are able to kind of think of this portraying their work and their um, uh, ideas and predictions about the city in a more public forum and we, because we don't exactly see the works as necessarily works of art but works of research and I hope we come back to that um, to that question about works of research because that's I think um, uh, an increasingly significant question in art schools. Um, the students examined uh, um, uh, urban conditions and thinking about revitalization, but it was also kind of an archaeological dig and a bit of kind of forensics as well. And I think they've all engaged in that in one way or another. Um, the modeled city is a kind of aggregated group of urban images as much as modeled forms. That word was, the, the word model was selected and as, as Charlie mentioned, I might use that word in a particular way. But when we think about what does modeling do? It miniaturizes. The Renaissance would, would know modeling as something that portrays light on an object in order to um, allow us, the viewer, to see it. So this is a relationship that we're trying to present when we're using that word model. Um, but it's also the thing that way we calculate things, the way we examine and quantify things now when we talk about modeling. Uh, we're modeling a lot of different parameters, whether they be about weather or uh, the, the kind of stats on, on masonry performance that uh, Charlie was talking about. So modeling was a way to think both traditionally, but also to think um, in the way that we're handling information in the, the contemporary world. We're thinking about the city, we're thinking about metamorphosis, its operative structure, and the creation and destruction of forms that both inspire um, kind of existing and new actions within the city. We started the project in the ceramics department, so all the, uh, the ceramic students had a kind of, I would say, uh, maybe anthropological kind of germ journey, beginning with that most elemental material, and that's how I, in some ways, how I like to think about clay, is this very fundamental medium of living storage and sustenance, um, but also this way that gives a kind of expression, creates images. So we wanted the students to face mo their modern city experience, but perhaps uh, to begin with, at least ritualizing and objectifying it by the manner of, of hand forming, of hand modeling, and constructing the surrogate to unlock and expose a kind of new set of props for themselves. Um, and I thought our investigati investigative choices were, were two, twofold, uh, to create interventions, which I think are rather um, 
reflective and also disruptive, but also to propose designs. And, and, and I think uh, colleagues on the stage gave you very good examples of what that could be. And in proposing designs, you're proactive. In some ways, you're futuristic. You're proposing the future. Um, I just wanted to end that just this sort of general introduction with a quote from Bernard Schumi. Is he American? Is he? Uh, but but he, he practices a lot in, in the U.S. Um, as an architect. And it's a quote from him. Architecture is not simply about space and form, but also about event, action, and what happens in space. And that those in some ways were the ways in which uh, I, I think we wanted to deliver the, the message of talking about architecture within the uh, pr probably the act of making a work of art. I thought I'd just pick a couple of themes, the constructed city and the civil community to talk about of the four themes that, um, uh, that have been mentioned by, by Drew. Um, the constructed city was a general theme that allowed uh, students to imagine new objects and structures within the city. Um, and as we look around a city, especially one like Akron, which is almost notable for the absence and the kind of void spaces within the city, which says so much about its, its history and its present, um, you're finding gaps and holes that could be filled. So that was, uh, we saw that as one opportunity for students. Um, but we also look back to history in some of the presentations we gave them. Uh, the Russians, uh, so we're talking about um, uh, the, the revolutionaries um, in the 1920s, used architecture and sculpture mostly to be emblematic, some things that were built, much proposed, to inspire their new form of governance and, and the new form of reflection about how cities and, and economies would be organized, how capital would be organized. Um, so the constructed city is thematic for someone, who, uh, for the student that we thought that might be uh, interested in the highly particular singular ideas that would be informative or stimulating to the city. Um, it could be something to do with the, the shared space of an inner city square. You might imagine even planning something as within the conventions of sculpture and installation, a media presentation perhaps, um, things that artists are doing today. Um, the other uh, uh, one that I wanted to focus on for a minute was the civil community, and I think a couple of students have, have kind of chased that one down. And if we were to look at maybe the, 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 the um, um, definition of c civil and civility, and it, but civil really starts as something that means that we're relating to the ordinary citizens and their concerns. So it's not strictly about being civil towards one another in the sense of courtesy and politeness, but in fact, a, a kind of a way of organizing public discourse. So the civil community was a kind of category that we thought for a certain kind of action. Maybe it's even citizen action or collective action. And it recommends a kind of perhaps a sociological approach to the city, intervening in existing interpersonal structures or examining them, uh, sometimes critiquing them. And I think we'll see some examples of students who are kind of adjacent to this idea. Um, students might be looking at the ethnic makeup or long-standing and newly developed uh, and but newly developed histories and how a city kind of forms its identity and that is often seen by the things that we build and the things that we have to operate from um, architecture um, uh, roadways circulation all of those things that enable us to be together uh, all these things factor into identity we discussed urban planning a little bit, uh, uh, notably Jane Jacobs and um, uh, the great, uh, uh, I think he's originally uh, born in England, but uh, becomes a, an important American urban planner, Lewis Mumford. Um, and uh, we're looking at uh, uh, these kinds of ways in which uh, cities uh, uh, form their, uh, they self-organize. And I think the students are actually, they, they natively know that. And looking at, at their own city of Akron um, helped them to think about projects for what they would do. Drew's been showing some pictures of, uh, of some of the artists that we looked at. Um, in fact, we don't have a name on this one. I forget who did this. He's an American artist um, who, and, and I think there was a kind of uh, wave of, of art that, um, in, in fact, bit into 
uh, the, the language and discourse of architecture that starts in the 90s and, and continues to this current day. A, a, an earlier slide was uh, Carter Attia's um, uh, home city of, uh, I forget, in Algeria, where he builds his, his city, his own town out of couscous. He's Algerian. This is the uh, food, uh, I guess, you know, the most common food stuff in there. And so where the artists use one material to um, begin a conversation about a, a kind of, you know, ethnic and cultural identity, but uses it, to, it deploys it in a, in a rather devious and subversive way to make a, a, another kind of observation and critique. Um, Drew? Uh, yes, so um, w we also examine things like the British Garden City and top-down Ermid planning, and mostly through images that we're showing the students. And so that they could see that, that uh, many people have thought about uh, how we can reconsider the places in which we live, whether it's the sort of classic um, Garden City that that comes out comes from England in the early 20th century, and and which ideas had a great impact on American life. Also, the the, the works of Le Cor the, the thinking of Le Corbusier and Frank Lloyd Wright, which had an impact on on kind of urban philosophy and um, how we would live in the city. So, in, in some ways, this this category of thought was really about a kind of a, an opportunity to think about utopian ideas and, and fictional communities as well. And as, as Drew said before, we also had the category of city as myth, and there we were looking at um, not only examples like Brasilia, but we were looking at how cinema dealt with the city. Um, on the screen right now, we have the work of the British artist uh, Mike Kelly, who takes these... Um, uh, you, you rather kind of pedestrian uh, idea of a, a building block, a Lego block, and completely paves the interior of a gallery. I think this is a project he did in Helsinki, and he completely takes it, uh, takes over the gallery by using both a decorative motif and and the the, the kind of force of a construction material. And you can, I guess, that's a picture of him and his team uh, working on. Uh, building these structures. So in some ways they're models and in some ways they're just uh, very much kind of expanded um, uh, decoration in the building. And I think it tweaks this uh, more, more ever-present relationship that, that the fields have as they butt up against each other. So when an artist begins to examining issues of architecture, and I think that's one of the things that we hope for in all of us in our, in our teaching is uh, interdisciplinarity, but without um, sacrificing the core of your own practice, of your own um, field, rather than kind of blending into a soup, but rather uh, becoming rather particular and uh, sharing what you know and rather updating it. And the next slide is more, I suppose, relates to the um, idea of a kind of civil community. Uh, where Anthony Gormley, I think this is in uh, somewhere in Scandinavia, where he, uh, in a rather democratic fashion, lets lets the townspeople become um, artists by uh, inflating a building for them, and uh, I think brings in several tons of clay and invites the community in over a number of days to kind of produce works uh, of their own interest. But collectively, we get this uh, almost city in miniature. Perfect. Thank you, Neil. Okay. Um, now, in presenting these uh, materials and these uh, events to students, we also wanted to create uh, that all-precious uh, opportunity to display what they have learned, but to also move around the city of Akron uh, in a way that they may not naturally do. I believe, as most of my colleagues have mentioned, uh, Akron is very much tied to the Rust Belt auto industry uh, inside of uh, the Midwest of America. And the history of Akron, if anyone does not know, is based on the tire. Three of the largest tire companies were cited in Akron, um, it, trying to create, in fact, a utopic city where people would work and uh, enjoy, uh, perhaps is the, the best word, factory life and all of the things that might come along with factory life, uh, whether that be home ownership or the ability to raise a family. What we once kind of recognized as the model dream or the model American dream was very much the uh, the impetus for bringing people 
um, out of the south and out of the uh, west to Akron to, to kind of carry that out. And what that's resulted in is a lot of kind of dynamic uh, things that I wouldn't really have thought uh, existed around uh, a city so small. The goal of this group in some way was to have four people who were not uh, from a place lead 15 people who were not originally from a place into an investigation of that place. And I decided to take the students on a bent of a historical exploration, which looked in fact at that um, richness that Akron had previously and tried to take that uh, richness as a way to reinvigorate it. I think as everybody is well aware, um, the auto industry does not have the uh, robustness that it once had. And I think that that factory uh, utopic city has in fact gone away. But one of the offshoots of this, we engaged with the university archives at the University of Akron. The University of Akron uh, was created uh, during the 50th anniversary of the city of Akron and has gone through a number of metamorphoses to be what it is today. But what it really means is it grew with the city um, as the city transitioned from a way station across the I O. Uh, excuse me, the Ohio and Erie canals uh, during the lock systems into this um, industrial city and now into what it is today. Um, all of these corporations had certain aspects that have been documented and enshrined inside of the university archives. So we asked the students to engage with the archives as part of their research and I think the best uh, jump out fact I found out was all of the Macy's Day, excuse me, Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade floats were produced and designed in Akron by the Goodyear company. So this is um, this is a primary research piece of uh, Bullwinkle, which was designed and sewn, introduced into production um, in the uh, early 50s for the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, uh, all constructed in Akron, Ohio. Um, we also uh, took time to engage with city planners who are working on what's called the Ohio Canal Intercept Tunnel. Um, assuming the EPA continues to exist, which I, I don't know if that's a safe assumption. Um, Ohio uh, and Akron are charged every time there is water overflow, uh, oil water overflow into the uh, Ohio River, which is just down the road from us. So they are building what's called an intercept tunnel and we were able to go on a trolley tour of that intercept tunnel. And this was created by bringing in a boring machine um, not like the four of us boring machine, but one that bores into a uh, rock. And this was introduced on a track into a hillside and cuts a reservoir tunnel underneath the city of Akron. The, the tunnel is in fact um, 480 meters long. Um, Neil, how long is that in feet? It's, it's longer than you can understand, but what it will hold is a million gallons of water. So in theory, every time there is a rain event, um, that water will collect under the city in the intercept tunnel and save the city uh, long term um, multi hundreds of millions of dollars every time they would be penalized by the EPA. Um, so we were able to go on a tour and actually see this is the boring uh, entrance tunnel. This was the closest we could get. Um, and as we discovered that kind of construction that was going on under our feet and under our lives on a daily basis, I think it triggered us to look backwards more at what was going on uh, in the city of Akron and that was uh, creating charrette research opportunities for students to see where um, they could find modules for building and what they could do with those modules. Uh, with Charlie's assistance we uh, found, uh, were donated 200 tires and we used a series of uh, industrialized machines to cut those tires apart from their round module to create a art material that was absolutely replenishable. Uh, in case you don't know, every time you change the tires on your car, you pay a $3 disposal fee. So every time you are willing to take a tire from a tire manufacturer, you are saving them money. And they are in fact very happy to give you used uh, bald tires for art making. So we designed a series of architectural installative objects for um, one of the major installations we would do with the students that involve taking tires and weaving and reshaping them into a, a display a, uh, object that was uniquely Akron. Um, I'm just marching through these. These are our students uh, working with the tires. 
um, to kind of see what they could do with it. We, we wanted to create hands-on experiences that, that may not have necessarily been in clay, but related to the thinking of clay, whether that is uh, forming or whether that is creating spaces that are uh, entwined or spaces that are, are containing some kind of volume. So our students ultimately wove tires across a frame structure that created a series of displays with which they could show their work on. And working with these tires um, began to encourage many of the students to investigate what either the beneficial aspects of tires were or what the negative aspects of tires were. Um, some students investigated the diseases uh, and cancers that cluster in places uh, around Akron and around Ohio as a state where manufacturing richly takes place. We have a number of uh, questions about the tire industry that, that have not been fully solved uh, and are kind of investigated by some of our students and others who decided to start painting with uh, liquefied rubber uh, to kind of match a, a material that was unique to their sense of place um, and one that began to uh, kind of give them a way to work that was unique to um, themselves as well, I guess. Other students more literally modeled cities, creating utopic visions of the uh, future. Um, this student investigated uh, Walt Disney's original concept, uh, excuse me, concept for the Epcot Center, which should have been a self-sustaining uh, center. Um, of biological life and human kind of experience, but eventually just became the theme park we all know uh, today. Um, other students investigated the history of Akron to look at Goodyear, and uh, if everybody remembers the Goodyear blimps. When I moved to Akron, I, I had totally forgotten the Goodyear blimps, except all summer uh, they exist in our skyline, and they live at the Goodyear Air Dock, um, which is now a building uh, that belongs to the Boeing a company, so it went from being a very public building to a very, very private building, as Boeing does uh, a lot of research for the United States military. And finally, students investigated the uh, history of Akron through uh, the Akron Tile and Marble Company. Akron was also famous for creating clay paste marbles and tiles uh, for a brief time in its period. As we are near the Ohio River, we have, in fact, natural clay deposits, and this student worked with those to create a series of mosaics. We had thought we would turn the format here from, from just a presentation for everybody to uh, both a Q&A and maybe some roundtable questions uh, that we had for ourselves. I'm going to close with Walter De Maria saying every good work should have at least two meetings, or ten meetings, excuse me. I, uh, I search, yeah, two meetings would be fine, right? Yeah. I searched that out in my own work of, uh, you know, how much do you build into your work um, that it's still able to deliver the power you want it to um, and have some kind of longevity? I think the fear in all that we do is that um, our thinking might not last through posterity. Um, and I know that I think everything we look back at has had multiple. Uh, meanings and layers and accretions. We had our students watch the original Blade Runner movie, um, and just one of those accretions was it happened at the same time the new Blade Runner movie came out. So we had this historical um, play that was 30 years kind of encapsulated in about three hours for ourselves. And, and that created a, a look of the future that, that did have multiple meanings over all sorts of time periods. Um, with that, I'm going to join the panel here, and if anybody has any questions, we will happily take them. Uh, it is requested that you come up to the center microphone there, right in the, uh, the middle, so that you can broadcast your question and we can hear it, um, and we can start there. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I found it very fascinating, very challenging, uh, thinking in new ways. Um, I am not quite sure what my question is. Uh, um, I am not an artist. I'm not uh, an academic. I have some background in planning, some background in economic development. So what occurred to me, you know, this program is a great way to do work of research on Akron. Is 
one of the intents of goals to, all right, how to improve Akron? Is there, where, where, how, how do you envision your students taking it and, and going from there? Or is it more in an artistic way? I'm, I'm not sure. So. Well, uh, I, I, we're in the context of an art school, so uh, where we're doing the project. So I, I think we can safely assume that, that if something comes out as a work of art, that there is, um, uh, that would be a kind of a logical conclusion. But I think it, um, I think the, w one of the important things is that we wanted to see the a kind of convergence of an examination of place with the idea of making something in response. That could be a critical response. It could be something where an artist, um, I don't know, intervenes in the status quo and, and does something, raises a political or sociological question. But, but I think it's really trying to think about the, the kinds of subjects ma subject matters that uh, I think are important to uh, our urban culture, but may not typically be be raised in an art school. So we thought asking a question that might be outside of the um, more um, assumed set of, of values and interests of the arts. But having said that, I think artists have demonstrated in the last um, uh, two generations that they have gone outside their the, the regular parameters of, of the field. And this was a kind of a uh, an extension of that question. How do you take on larger subject matters that are of some importance to those, uh, to everyone, you, you know, in a, of a particular place? So it was a kind of collective effort to look at, to look at the urban condition, I suppose. It's actually really a great question, and I, I would come back and just kind of uh, note that uh, Akron, Ohio is um, one of the cities under the Knight Foundation. Um, and the Knight Foundation is in awe, is the philanthropic offshoot of the Knight Publishing Company. Uh, and what that is uh, established to do is create a series of civil engagement projects that beautify and better um, the cities that, that the Knight Foundation touches. Um, and it's created a kind of push-pull for me um, in a lot of ways. A, a number of my colleagues and a number of my students go on to uh, win Knight Foundation grants and they, they go on to add things to the city that, that give it character um, and in a lot of uh, ways beautify the city but don't in fact really impact the root questions. Uh, we have urban blight, we have urban poverty um, because of the fleeing of manufacturing jobs and things like this. Um, I was really loath to kind of come up with a, another project to add to that uh, material and rather was happy to keep it speculative. The, the notion of modeling for me is often a way of creating and fleshing things out, um, but not necessarily having to come up with a full answer. We conceive this case study as a 15-week case study, and uh, long term that seems like a, a good chunk of time, but, but really I think anyone engaged in research um, quickly finds that 15 weeks goes by quite quickly. So we had asked the students to come up with iterative projects that might in fact have legs and allow them to uh, build off this and maybe seek that answer of what they could be contributing as uh, young people engaged in civil discourse long uh, after the time of our uh, case study here completed. So we really did try to leave it open-ended and let them um, you know, as the controllers of the future engage that in their own way. Uh, just a just a side comment to this. The, I think the Excel Center at the University of Akron facilitates many of those projects mm -hmm. trying to do very specific uh, interventions with, I would say, the real world settings. And um, I was involved in another project that um, took place last fall, I believe, that Matthew Kolodzie and yes. Peter Niworowski were leading, and that was about the interaction between the University of Akron as a uh, campus that is not very distinctly bordering with the city, but actually takes over a large part of downtown Akron, and that project was about the intersection between the city and the mm -hmm. university, mm -hmm. and students also did uh, 
quite interesting projects that were about traffic conditions, improving the accessibility of the campus with bicycles and stuff like that. So it was really interesting to see how the consciousness of the students shifted towards uh, from from being like consumers or exposed to a city fabric to people who understand a bit more how this fabric has emerged uh, in a historical development and still emerges and is uh, can be positively influenced by whatever they want to do so understanding the city as something that is created also by them even being not architects and, and maybe not designers uh, is is a very important, um, I think, lesson that they take from this. I, th I think also it's it's a nice way to um, to immerse the students. I mean, mm -hmm. if you think about learning a language, the best way to learn a language is through immersion, right? So, um, just getting the students into the city um, and making them the experts of the city, you know, sort of from the inside out. But also, I think it was it was a really nice experience because. Um, the students were always inherently getting their hands dirty, and, and I think that, um, <laughs> in and in the case of the tires, sometimes a bit bloody. Um, but I think that also speaks to some some other forms of um, you know mimetic um, mimetic nature of things and sort of realizing things through their hands. I, as a side note, I taught a um, I taught a summer studio, an architecture studio in Paris, and um, my ultimate goal was to. Uh, have the students spend the least amount of time in their dorm rooms mm. um, and so they were all assigned an arrondissement and they were all um, asked to be the expert of that um, of that arrondissement and to to basically give something back to that arrondissement the, my, my favorite project was um, one student set up a lemonade stand in, in a series of alleys um, and served the public and she she learned a whole lot this was just an experiment but it, she learned a whole lot about um, the city and that particular um, neighborhood um, based on her um, based on her exploratory uh, lemonade stand, so <laughs> it was also really, really good lemonade. So <laughs> <laughs> that helped. Andrew, did you want to pose a question that? Um, well, we have another another oh, question. Great. Oh, great! Fortunately, oh. hi. <laughs> or fortunately, this is a live mic. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you guys very much for that presentation. It was awesome um, and inspiring. Uh, one of the things that uh, I think is, a, is sort of a question that we've been I've been grappling with for a while, and I think it like comes up especially when architecture and art kind of get in the same space. Is like, uh, how, like what's the role of semiotics as like a functional and structural kind of component to what it is that. Uh, that is it that is either built or, or constructed and um, I guess to, to develop the question a little bit like it seems all the time like or like like often that like um, semiotics are sort of the last thing that architects are thinking about and maybe that like structure and form might be the last things that artists are thinking about and um, <laughs> clay and ceramics is sort of like an maybe a small exception to that but I was just sort of wondering if you could like talk a little bit about like uh, maybe like for example Charlie as you're developing that roof system like uh, the sort of like like visual conveyance of it or um, conversely like h how do you sort of like couch um, uh, conveyance in, if I could call it that in like uh, in structure and, and vice versa and this is a question for all of you and especially Petra too is the biomimesis person thanks thanks Ari um, I was talking to, to Petra earlier about the, the kind of wave of the tire, and uh, you may not like the answer, um, but I'll try to I'll try to get somewhere here. Um, but the that patterning is actually from the tire itself. The tire, because of the way it's reinforced, it really really wants to be round. Mm -hmm. uh, and Drew's um, students found that out really quickly when they cut the tire through the tread and started to flatten it out. It just folded right back up, um, you know, because of the way it's reinforced. So um, that sort of patterning. Um, is is the true nature of the tire. I mean, we we're trying to, uh, my research assistant and I were trying to flatten the tire for a really, really long time, and it was just not working. The tire did not want to do that. Um, alternatively, uh, the installation at volume, the, the conical helices, um, for me, uh, another portion of my work is, uh, is about the, the human body and our sort of relation to the human body. And um, does anyone know how much uh, volume the human body and a tire displaces? 
uh, it's 2.8 cubic feet. They're exactly the same. So the the car, um, the car and the, the tire is something that we're all very very familiar with. But I think it's um, it takes it takes a step further. You know, just further than um, seeing car uh, sorry tires on a car, um, but to the scale of the body. So it's the sort of familiar um, building unit. You know, much like a brick, um, which is the scale of a hand, or the cinder block, which is sort of the scale of two hands. Um, you know, the tire is this this um, unit that's the scale of the body. So. Um, I try, uh, yeah. So from the perspective of biomimetics, um, language is extremely important. So, so there's one issue we have with uh, translating from one discipline to the other. And uh, we also translate meaning from one side to the other side. And uh, biomimetics is often um, interpreted as a field that translates form or function or ecosystems levels from biology or nature to technology. And um, when I started to be interested in, in this subject, this formal translation was something that um, I was kind of looking down on. So I, I, I was almost like arrogant towards those projects, translating shapes and uh, by translating shapes also appearance and, and meaning of whatever people uh, uh, thought would be interesting. But um, the longer I work in this field, the more I become aware of, f of form and shape and meaning being something really, really important. On the one side, also having a very strong functional correlation. If you look at biology, so form is something that is very determined by what the thing actually does. And it's always highly multifunctional and mul multidimensional. That's why I also like this uh, quote that uh, uh, Drew brought very much. So it, uh, if you look at nature, it's really difficult to figure out the primary function of whatever you're looking at. So it's really multidimensional. And uh, I think one of the challenges is to, to cope with this and to allow for a, for a breadth of translation that captures, I would say, a quality that we are interested in. And that's a more holistic thing that is difficult to, to you know, grasp sometimes. Yeah. <coughs> Ari, that's a difficult question you asked. <laughs> um, because uh, the way I take what you're asking, if semiotics is about signs and signifiers, um, maybe we're talking about uh, that every object is encoded with a number of, mm. uh, s well, <laughs> I'm going to use uh, d another uh, were derived from it as signatures. And it, you know, at various times, architecture has uh, delivered information. If you know, I fondly remember looking at the third century church in um, uh, Ravenna. And you know, so this in building, building is encoded with at least two languages. There's a narrative language, and that's a very important one because that's in fact what ceramics has historically, I mean it's served two masters. It's the brick that holds the building up, the masonry block that overachieves in, um, in, in Charlie's, uh, uh, in his, the first piece that he showed. Wasn't that a great piece? <laughs> that's that's like, it's amazing. Um, uh, but. So there, there's, uh, you know, I mean, maybe this is the two levels that the two layers of that Walter De Maria, um, it, well, he needs eight more, but um, <laughs> the, the two that I would give him are, are that the, the buildings are communicating in a couple of ways. Um, but that's, that's if you examine them in isolation. But we can't really. It's the composite. It's the aggregate of all these things that happens. But it's the individuality of each of them that makes them all kind of like people in there. So the city is full, and we appreciate those cities that have a mix. Akron has a, the, their art museum, and it has this uh, parasitical steel structure around the original uh, kind of uh, Italianate uh, kind of building. That's the, the work of Kupimoblau on it. So it, you know, so you have people talking to each other in there through objects through acts of art 
or through acts of criticism, one of the students uh, who perhaps is at the back, uh, looking at the, the kind of health issues, you know, and, and saw that as a kind of, uh, so that's, and I don't think looking at semiotics per se, because it wasn't looking at, at a thing that, that could speak, but rather she was using, I think, the, the, the ideas, the few ideas that we presented as a way to kind of map something. And architecture creates maps. In, in, and then you need maps to figure out how to navigate architecture. But maps are, you know, now have become generally seen as a way we uh, compose information, but uh, how we circulate information, how we communicate things. So you've got these different sort of layers going on. So the, the semiotics thing is a really interesting question. Um, and it's who, who as the, the the person who learns how to read things more is the person that will get more things out of it. So um, semiotics is, a, uh, I think, an appropriate uh, kind of response to a, a way of uh, asking what does, how does an object communicate? Um, we, we saw the work of Amanda on this, this the, one of the last slides with the Goodyear, the dirigible kind of sausage kind of building, which is an amazing building in itself. It's and an air dock. An air dock. What did I call it? A sausage. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. A sausage. Uh, right. right. Um, but actually an air dock in there. And how she pitted together the, 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 uh, this set of words, which I, I hadn't seen. Uh, not, most of this word I hadn't seen. The, this almost the radiant city of the, what's that, Epcot or Epcot, what's that? Yep. Yeah. Disney's yeah. Epcot. Yeah, well, interesting. So you, you look at the, these, some of these things that the students are kind of backing into, sometimes knowing, sometimes not. I look at that and I think, wow, is, is that, uh, you know, did Le Corbusier uh, des design that? You know, how does that fit into other ways in which to kind of see the city? So it was kind of fascinating to see the model in which uh, one of the students created the one I was just thinking about with the, with the Goodyear. This sort of big commemorative uh, a plate in in this big slash behind the air dock slash sausage. Um, so Neil, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna cut you off there if I might. Uh, uh, perhaps we can continue that I, later. I, I object, but um, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> but in in my role as a moderator here, I want to uh, maybe begin to try to close this circle a little bit. This is still very much an open investigation for us. We're still kind of uh, chopping our way through it, uh, despite the that our time here in this panel is coming to a close. I want to start by thanking you all for joining us and going uh, through this kind of midterm research report with <laughs> us. Um, but more than that, I kind of want to take the last few minutes to uh, fade to black in a, maybe the most genteel way possible. I'm wondering uh, if I could ask the, the three panelists up here uh, a question that's kind of been bothering uh, me and I think the students as well from the kind of uh, scuttlebutt and back talk you hear as an educator. Um, what exactly is the value of a model to you? Is it something that is, is supposed to be like a standalone art? or an art, um, or is it something that is made uh, to create information and create a pathway? Um, maybe you each could just f uh, file us out, sing us out on the, um, you know, a minute each kind of thinking about that question, if you don't mind. Can I start? Oh, absolutely. So from my perspective, I, I learned to do architectural modeling to have a representation of a space. So that was like a starting point, and I'm really having a hard time making the students that I have now understand that uh, a model is not only that, a model is also exploring something. So even in architectural design, we don't only make models to show off what we have to people who cannot read plans. Um, we also make models for ourselves to understand what we're actually doing and to really perceive a space in an analog way, and uh, the distinction between virtual modeling and, and analog modeling is, is getting blurred mm -hmm. increasingly. So I think especially with this new technology of projecting stuff into a 3D space and really manipulating things in 3D, this will also change the notion of modeling. And in biomimetics, modeling is really important for us to 
to understand systems. So making very crude models of biological phenomena that we see, if it's, I don't know, for example, we had a project where we used the puffer fish that puts up spikes, and we made very simple models made out of toothpicks and balloons and uh, nylons to create, recreate, uh, uh, mimic uh, a multi-layer skin where those spikes are embedded and by inflating the system, those spikes are automatically put up. So by making those very crude models, we had a really nice way of understanding what was going on in that system. So I think uh, creating those simplified representations helps us a lot going, going along. And in this way, I would say a model is something that translates into another sphere and also helps us learn about materials and uh, material properties and material qualities, yeah. That's a, that's a pretty smart question, Drew, because of course you know that the, if there's uh, three people up, you'll, you're, you'll get very, very different answers, <laughs> uh, just like when I asked Petra today at lunch, what is architecture? <laughs> um, but I, I liked what Neil said at the beginning of today's discussion, is a, a model is a way to think about how to, how to build things, it's a way to think about how, um, but it's also a way to think about uh, what, and it's also a way to um, to see, there's there's a lot of architects that will talk about um, you know building models to see the building. Um, one of which is Frank Gehry, whose buildings are absolutely crazy, um, but in his office he builds uh, no fewer than three different scales of models. So he'll build um, they'll build a model at this scale, they'll build a model at the height of, of all of us. Um, but he he uses those models to see and to see the building. But I also um, I always tell um, students that the model. Um, architecturally is the building just at a smaller scale it's performative you can push on it you can think about structures um, etc um, in my own research modeling is really really important to um, as Petra started to speak about um, really really push materials and to think about how those materials react much like the tires and how they do not they refuse to um, lay flat um, so models for me are, are, are mock-ups or, or larger things um, that start to really question uh, how and the process but um, really, really, um, mostly just just give the really honest uh, material take that I'm interested in. I think I think what uh, Charlie and Petra said are exactly the right things to to say about what a model might be. And perhaps the only thing I would do is is just uh, uh, recast that one more time. And I would just say that the model is really the first stage of realizing an idea, but it's not the end. Thanks. Thank you all very much for joining us this afternoon.